All right, let's say a little bit about the electrical transport in ceramics, ionic materials, and polymers, okay? So typically both of these are insulators, right? If you have a dinner plate or a piece of plastic, usually these things are not gonna conduct electricity very well because they don't have free carriers. Their electrons are tied up in strong bonds for the most part, and so they're not gonna be good conductors of electricity. Or in other words, they have a large band gap, okay? So you have to heat them really to high temperatures before they start to conduct. Um, let's talk about ionic ceramics first. Ionic ceramics, right, you have your cation and your anion. These have different size, they have different charge, right? But because they are charged, right, you've got like sodium chloride, you've got your chloride ion, and you've got your little sodium ion, sodium plus, right? If you apply an electric field, what should you get? Well, in the direction of the electric field, this, this sodium ion should want to actually move over here, and your chlorine should want to move the other direction, technically, right? So if you had a ceramic material that allowed for ions to move and you have to get both moving, otherwise you're going to get uh, problems of charge neutrality, right? You have to have both of them able to move. Then you could get significant electrical conductivity by the ions themselves moving, which is pretty cool. We talked about this previous in the semester when we talked about YSZ, right? That was like this material that was... Um, Right? We made like sensors out of it because it had a bunch of oxygen vacancies, and that allowed oxygen ions, oxygen 2 plus, to travel through the material. Right, Oxygen in an ionic form could travel through that, and you can make oxygen sensors and all sorts of really cool things with those. Right, So the overall electrical conductivity will account for both terms, the ionic contribution and the electronic contribution. Normally, electronic is small. There do exist materials that are both electric and ionic conductors. They can conduct both species, both electrons, uh, and ions to get, so those are possible. Something to note here is that the mobility of ionic transport is going to be equal to the number of your ions times the charge of them times their diffusivity, right? The diffusion coefficient divided by thermal energy. So normally with a metal we said that its mobility drops uh, as you heat up, and with we said also with semiconductors that the mobility also drops, but here you can see a rise because your mobility depends on temperature because not only is it going to drop due to thermal vibrations, but D itself, the diffusion coefficient, we know that it depends on temperature in an exponential, right? D is equal to D naught exponential of our activation energy for diffusion over our thermal energy. So even though it is going to vibrate more and that's going to slow things down, you get much more uh, higher, higher diffusion coefficients, so you actually see a rise uh, with temperature, so it becomes more conductive typically. Now what about polymers? Polymers, again, uh, the electrons are usually tied up in bonds, and so they're not available to conduct. Um, but that all changed in 1977 in the compound polyacetylene. That's this one over here, polyacetylene. It had the electrical conductivity that was actually quite high, 1.5 e to the 7 uh, per ohm meter. Um, so this is about a quarter of copper based on volume, and it's uh, about two times the conductivity of copper based on weight. So this led to now a dramatic revolution in conductive polymers. Nowadays, we have lots of different types of conductive polymers. The hallmark of all conductive polymers, or almost all of them anyways, is this alternating double, single, double, single, double bond. What that eventually essentially leads to is that the, the P bonds, which are sort of dumbbell shaped like this, you end up with them filled in one but empty in the other. And so what does that look like from a band diagram? That looks like this, right? Your, that your Fermi level is right in the middle of a band where you have a filled energy level and an empty. So when you have these alternating double and single bonds, that's essentially what you're getting is you're getting a half-filled band. And so sure enough, these things can conduct electricity. And now imagine what you could do if you have a polymer that can conduct electricity. You can make all sorts of crazy things. First off, it's anisotropic conductivity, right? It's going to happen along these polymer chains, right? Whereas a metal, you basically get conductivity all over the place. Um, you get very low density. These things don't weigh very much. They are flexible. They're amenable to polymer processing. They're typically abundant. So this has led to some really cool things like polymer batteries, OLEDs, right? If you go to the store and you see like an OLED TV, that's an organic light emitting diode. So it has PN junctions. This, this is not science fiction. This is a real material you see in this picture here. You can actually make screens and stuff that fold because they are organic semiconductors, right? They've still been doped to have a PN junction, but they did that in an organic way. So it's not as simple as like the boron and phosphorus picture with silicon. It's more complicated than that, and so it's beyond the scope of this class. But just know that it exists, and there are whole classes now on conductive polymers and the cool things that we can do with conductive polymers, as well as um, ionic conducting ceramics and things we can make out of those.